So there's this very popular video going around at the moment, which quite rightly highlights this dismissive attitude, particularly in the Middle East and Asian regions, where women get this very short end of the stick when it comes to violence against women. Why work late and be independent? In fact, why work at all? That's what husbands are for. Fun fact, if he's your husband, it's not rape. Women who wear skirts are the leading cause of rape. However, there is part of this video, which is a very widely seen message online, that from my seat is just so bloody stupid. And this is the sentiment that just because something is against the law, that you should under no circumstances take steps to reduce your risks in such an environment. I mean, the largest straw man here is this idea that we don't teach our children not to rape. Bollocks. Yes, we do. Not only that, we teach them not to steal, not to murder, and to not do all sorts of other things. And yet, curiously, rape, murder, and theft still exist in society. Probably the simplest way of explaining this concept is through an analogy. Put your hands up if you have a lock on your front door. Why do you do that? Why do you put a lock on your front door when theft is against the law? Yeah, why teach me to put a lock on my door? Why not teach your children not to steal? Or how about telling someone that they shouldn't visibly wear lots of expensive gear and flash their cash around a neighborhood where there is a high rate of depression and violent crime? Why, why teach them to do that? Why not teach them not to mug people? I would further add that people have different sexual drives, and the idea that you will simply be able to educate people out of their sexuality is unlikely to be successful. Don't believe me? Take a look at all those Christians who decided that homosexuality was wrong, that it was evil, and that all you had to do was to educate people out of it. It was therapy that would help me change from being homosexual to straight. That's how he described it? Yes. He basically said, if you do this, what? You wouldn't be gay anymore. If I did this and worked his therapy program, you know, God could perform a miracle and I could no longer be gay. Yes, sexual attitudes seem to be pretty deeply biologically ingrained, and I have significant doubts that you will effectively be able to educate people out of them. I agree but there's going to be in that No, situation. that's not true. If you train and men not to grow up to become rapists, you, you prevent think, you rape. Think you, can that stop, you think, you think you can tell a rapist to stop doing what he's doing? We're, yes, yes. You really, and he's going to listen to yes, a, 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 an ad campaign There are organizations stop? that do this. Men, stop, men can stop rape. Men stopping violence. They train young men listen. to not rape. A former Boy Scout with movie star looks and charm to match, crisscrossed the country, a devious predator in search of prey. 30 young girls and women, ages 13 to 26, were raped and murdered before cops finally collared Ted Bundy. Sure, there will be some environmental influences, but the bottom line is, I think you will have very limited success in trying to educate, say for instance, a serial sexual predator out of their sexuality. Look, the bloody obvious, even if something is against the law, then you're a moron if you do not take simple steps to minimize your risks of becoming a victim of that crime. This is why we teach kids not to get into cars with strangers. Rather than holding up signs saying, don't teach my kids not to get into cars with strangers, educate your children not to abduct, sexually abuse, and murder children. As for the second straw man in the title, well, for that, you've got to take a closer look at the crime of rape. Now, from what I've read on the subject of rape, it seems to fall on a spectrum going from the traditional depictions of violent rape, which seems to be much more a crime of violence and domination than it is of sexual gratification. And such assaults make up a relatively small amount, maybe only 10% of the total rapes. This bleeds into things like date rape, where there may actually be some elements of a normal relationship. And indeed, in many such cases, the victims know their attackers. Here, the desire for sexual gratification from the male plays a larger part than the physical domination part. 
Then you go through the transition between rape and just bad sex. And like it or not, such a transition exists. I mean, for example, well, it was fully consensual to start with, but when we went at it, the sex was just awful. And at the end, I asked them to stop, but they finished anyway. Or, well, the sex was just awful, and I wanted them to stop, but I didn't let them know. Because, well, whatever, they were my friend, and I didn't want to hurt their feelings. Or they'd made a real sweet effort earlier to make me feel special, and whatever. This then bleeds into the weakest claims of rape, which are of the ilk that, sure, I chose of my own volition to get drunk off my face. Full in the knowledge that such intoxication in a public place was going to make me more gregarious. And sure, I fully consented at the time. But in the hard light of the morning after the night before, I decided that I wouldn't have done it if I was sober. Therefore, it was not consensual. Therefore, it was rape. Let me be clear, drunk or not, you are responsible for your own actions. You cannot simply drive drunk and then when you do something you regret, be free from all responsibility of your actions by later saying, well, yeah, I wouldn't have driven that way when I was sober. You do something when you're drunk, that's your responsibility, no matter whether you're a guy or a girl. Someone drugs you or similar, well, that's a whole different story. But you are responsible for your actions, even if you choose to get drunk first. This is not slut shame. This is not victim blaming. This is just owning what you chose to do. Like it or not, there is a spectrum here. And like it or not, your choices in society modulate your chances of being in these various situations. If you really want to reduce such problems, to, are you saying that women deserve to be raped for wearing short skirts? then you have simply not been paying attention and you have oversimplified the problem to the point where you are no longer making a constructive contribution or for that matter, reducing the chances of women getting raped. Again, to take the analogy with theft, you choose to put locks on doors to reduce your chances of being burgled. Only a moron takes his locks off the door and puts a sign in the window saying, don't teach me to put locks on my door, teach your children not to steal. And it's not just dumb feminists who hold this line. The Rape Crisis Center of England and Wales states, if you have been raped, the most important thing to remember is that it was not your fault. And while this might be mostly true, it is also not helpful in reducing the number of rapes because the statement implies that women have no agency of their own, no ability to affect the outcome by taking sensible precautions. That is, the statement reduces women to the level of passive objects who have no control whatsoever over their environment. This is just not true. Women do have minds. They are capable of risk and hazard assessment and minimizing such factors. This statement encourages women to think they have no influence whatsoever on what happens to them, and that there is nothing that they can do to minimize the risks of being sexually assaulted. And that's just a really bad message to send in that it subjects women to enhanced risk of sexual assault by inhibiting them from trying to minimize their risks of becoming a victim. So what common sense precautions can be taken to reduce your chances of being raped? Well, for violent rape, if you spend some time reading accounts from serial rapists and murderers, they tend to choose their victims based on body language. This is rarely anything as facile as wearing a short skirt. Here, the cues tend to be not so much how you dress, although this is communicating things about you. It's do you have the body language of someone who would make a good victim? Now, I can give much advice on self-defense, but I'm going to be very brief here. By far the best weapon you have to fight against a stronger, more powerful adversary is psychology. Point in question, the simple wasp. The wasp is typically a factor of a million smaller than a man or a woman, and yet they manage to effectively discourage people from attacking them. 
women are typically only 10% smaller than their male counterparts. And for those who find this a little too cryptic, people know that a wasp will fight to defend itself. That's its self-defense mechanism. And that fact alone will discourage most attackers. Put simply, predators look for the body language of prey. The best self-defense mechanism in such an environment is not to telegraph the body language of the victim. Hi. Every 45 seconds, a black man enters an elevator and some stupid white bitch clutches her purse for her dear life. Now, you might not think we notice, but we do. The small step to the side, your subtle death grip on your belongings. And I know what many of you will be saying, oh, that's easy of you to doll out such advice. You've never been in such a situation. Well, actually, I have. All alone in the very late evening on a mountain pass with no one around for miles. I faced a predator, a mountain lion, with a cub that was stalking me. I played the game for real stakes. Had I given off the body language of the victim, of the prey, there is a very real possibility that I wouldn't be here making this video. But for those of you who feel more comfortable with a more civic analogy, burglars look for people who have left their windows unlocked in the same way that sexual predators look for the body language of the victim. This is not victim blaming. This is giving people advice on how to avoid becoming one. As for date rape, the golden rule seems to be be aware of your circumstances. Be cautious about ending up all alone with someone you don't really trust. Now there is a fine line to tread here. Dating is usually the prelude to a relationship. And if you want a relationship, trust is going to be core to that relationship. Similarly, showing large amounts of trust on a date is a significant token of commitment to a potential relationship. It also increases your potential vulnerability. It's a tough choice, but if you're going to get paranoid about trusting people, it will undermine both your ability to form and maintain healthy relationships. Sadly, this advice will almost probably be entirely disregarded by almost everyone. Because you see, most people who want a relationship with someone are driven almost exclusively by emotion. And those tend to be far more influential factors than such reasoned arguments. Be aware that people communicate, not just by words, but also by the inflection in their voices. People communicate through body language. And in this case, I'm going to include what you wear in that. People who wear suits are communicating something about themselves. People who spend lots of time grooming are telling you something about themselves. And I do not need to tell the ladies the bloody obvious that your choice of clothes is a statement about yourself. And whilst most date rapes seem to be crimes of opportunity, there are still nonetheless actions that you control exclusively. For example, if you dress and act erotically, if you put on the body language of foreplay, the strong eye contact, the tactile touching, if you telegraph such information, but actually have no interest in such things, you are increasing the chances that someone will misread the signs as interest or sexual initiation or so on. In non-body language terms, it's the equivalent of saying that you'll buy someone dinner at a very nice, very expensive restaurant, and then when the bill comes saying, well, I didn't actually mean that, I just enjoyed seeing the gratitude in your eyes when you thought I thought you were special enough to take you to this really nice restaurant. But for the record, how would that make you feel if it happened to you? Be clear, and above all, be honest with your body language, and this will probably reduce the chances of you ending up in situations where there have been miscommunications. <laughs> Look, I'm an honest, honest guy, to the point where if someone's going to see my body naked, I usually have a little problem in letting them see my mind naked as well. And many under such circumstances reciprocate the gesture. 
It seems to me that after many intimate conversations that about one girl in three has had a traumatic sexual experience that has had a disproportionate effect on how they deal with subsequent relationships. And to be honest, I feel for their deep and long-term mental scars and just how much more beautiful I could be had they not been so damaged. But to be honest, reducing this problem to something as simple as saying women should bear no responsibility for their own safety and should under no circumstances be aware of the situations that are likely to lead them into these situations where they will acquire these mental scars, things like date rape, is counterproductive. It really is as stupid as saying, yeah, don't teach me to lock my doors, teach them not to steal. It's just so stupid, it's not productive. There is an optimum line here, somewhere between assuming all men are rapists and should never be trusted under any circumstances, and 100% trusting every man that you meet, or to absolutely respect your personal desires. Every time I hear such stories, it's clear that some, if not many, of these traumatic instances could have been avoided if many of these young girls had been given a simpler heads up about risk minimization, about predator avoidance, and so on. Things that the Rape Crisis Centre of England and Wales don't even seem to think was worth mentioning. You know, it's kind of like reading up about mountain lions before heading into an environment where you know there are such predators. I would add one more thing. The people who have been badly scarred by such events are probably not the best people to give advice on such subjects, as they are more likely to disproportionately represent the danger. Let's be real. Boy meets girl, and after a while, they ride off into the sunset is a happy ending that puts a smile on everyone's face. And trust is a big part of that happy ending. Telling young women that they should be paranoid that all men that they meet are potential rapists and should never be trusted is not something that's going to increase the number of happy boy meets happy girl and ride off into the sunset hand in hand. Now, accurately assessing a hazard does not mean you will never experience that danger. You can minimize your chances of getting raped. Do everything that you can to minimize your chances of getting raped and still get raped. You can minimize your chances of being killed and eaten in the wild, but still get killed and eaten. But it will minimize your chances of being in such a situation, while allowing you the greatest chances of achieving your desires. For comparison, when I go into the wilderness, I know there are predators there. It's just an inherent risk that I incur when I enter that environment. But for the wonders that I have seen, for the joys that I have experienced, it's a gamble that I happily accept. Having said that, it would just be stupid of me, in the extreme, knowing that there are such predators in this environment, to not minimize my chances of becoming a victim. Or maybe a more simple analogy, I lock my windows for security. But to brick them up for complete security would be dumb as it would just rob me of the pleasure of living in this place.